Anabi Pretorius, Plastics SA Executive, Technical Operations, talking about where is the South African plastic industry in its transition to the circular low carbon economy. Sorry, good day everyone. They said the lights will be bright, but this is incredibly bright. It's an honor to talk directly after the minister, but it's a pity she's not here because I think she needs to hear also what I'm going to tell you today. Wait. Sorry, that jumped a bit. So um, thanks for Safripal for inviting me. And like Michael, I'm also one of the recycled <laughs> speakers. Um, so hopefully there's something new for each of you today. So what is the circular economy? Now, the minister talked about sustainability. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation talk about eliminate waste, and you're going to hear that a lot today. Circulate products and regenerate nature. So what is the planet going to look out for the next generation and the one to come? Unido talks about durability, the design side. Recycle it back into the system. So when I put my talk together, I thought I can be very theoretical and give you the academic background, or I can really just talk what is happening today in South Africa. Obviously, I chose the latter because I'm much more practical and hands-on in nature. So if I put different words into this definition, it is, are we keeping the product the same for as long as possible? So fixing. Use that poppy yarn spanner and, and fix your products. Get your washing machine fixed instead of buying another one. Sew your clothes, turn it into something else. But in the plastics products context as well. If not, use the same material over and over. Failing that, use the petrochemical, the resource, over and over. And finally, the energy. So put different words to it. The reuse side, the recycle side, the plastic to raw materials, and then finally the, the energy side. What are we doing in South Africa? We're not so good on number one. So are we have any reuse in place? And if I only focus on packaging, we now have tertiary packaging, pallets, crates. There's a lot of them in reuse. If we look at non-packaging, the wheelie bin, I think, is a classic example. Chairs, how often have you driven on the highway and a truck in front of you for chairs going from one venue to another venue? Then there's the beverage bottles. And to my shock, I actually confirmed yesterday that finally, when they reach the end of life, they're not recycled because they're made from PETG and not PET. So I think we also need to look at that. So if we do have reuse models that they still recyclable at the end of its life. And then our big water fountain bottles that we use, I think that's a classic example in every office of reuse, refill. There's even stations where you can take your home water bottles and, and get them filled. So recycling is really where we in South Africa are doing pretty well. So that's the second one, keeping the material in circulation for as long as possible. Now every year, Plastics SA, do an annual survey on what do we actually recycle in South Africa. So the last year's findings, you can see we're recovering slowly after COVID. There's a bit of an increase in the tonnages. We export minute quantities. Res uh, waste collected and exported, less than half a percent. Finished, recycled, exported, we're talking 8%. You'll see PVC is actually the big contributor there. But what I want to emphasize is that very last line there. The tonnage is not collected for recycling. And that have also increased. And that is really our problem. You hear the minister talking about the waste, the leakage into the environment. And that's where the challenge lies. So for recycling to be effective, there really need to be a couple of things in place. And I'm going to allow you to read through this slide because I want you to take cognizance of each of those points. Is the product designed correctly? Can we actually collect it? And is it being collected? 
And you hear me many more times saying today, that's our problem at this stage. Do we have specs in place for the guy collecting and supply to the recycler? Do we have standards in place for the recycler? And thanks to Safripol that have come with the Aspire R, because they have ensured that already, for at least for PET. And then all these environmental claims. This is more green than this one. We see it from our retailers, we see it from our brand owners. And how many of those are really substantiated? The CSIR have a brand new laboratory to test biodegradability. They're totally idle. No one sent their products there. We rather just believe the supplier that this bag, this film, this bucket, this shoe soles are biodegradable. So what have we done in the last couple of years? <coughs> you can see the tonnages, and maybe graphs is not as interesting to you as to me, so I won't spend too much time on that. But what is important here is that we've actually grown 50% since 2011. And sorry for that, my computer graph didn't quite align with the, um, the team in, in the background. But yeah, that's, that's okay. But remember, we also increased the number of tons that we did not collect. So if we look at the input recycling rate, we're not really going anywhere. Oh, thanks so much, Michael. If we look at the output recycling rate, we're also not going very, <laughs> very much upwards. Tonnages help because we consume more, but the rates haven't increased that dramatically. So what are these different rates? Very academic for, for this time of the morning, but in essence we're saying collected is everything potentially that can be recycled. And I've heard the minister said 400 million tons of waste gets generated. We don't actually make that much polymer per year in, South, uh, in the world currently. We're still under the 400 million tons. And plenty of that product is not ending up as waste because that's our main water supply pipes. That's our carpets in our homes. That's our gutters. That's our motor cars. They definitely don't end up as waste every year. So when we calculate collection rates, we look at the products, typically the consumer good products and packaging, both recycled and, and virgin products, and we're saying, out of that, how much did we collect it for recycling? And we're sitting at about 43%. If we look at our output recycling rates, there we use pretty much what the rest of the world is using. How much did we make, and how much did we turn into pellets again, recycle it, and it's that percentage, just to, to explain the difference. So if we look at output recycling rates for packaging specifically, um, where are we sitting? And you can see linear low and low density polyethylene, the stuff your bread bags, and the plastic around your toilet paper, and the plastic your frozen vegetables comes in. We, we're doing very well there at 38%. HDPE is also very good, that's your bread crates and your milk bottles, we're also good there. PET beverage bottles is fantastic, but there's some other PET we do not recycle. And then your polyprop. If we put the minister's EPR rates on the same graph, we see we have room for improvement, and that was for year one. Um, now, obviously, what I did here was taking averages, because for polyolefins, we have rigid targets and flexible targets. I combined the two to get a target for HD and for LD. So if we put it schematically, what are we recycling from a material point of view? And if I didn't show you this and I've asked the audience, I think most of you would have said, pet bottles. Because that's the one that's visible. We can see the waste pickers pick them up. Tonnage-wise, in other words, volume, that's not the biggest one, it's actually our low density. So your bread bags, even your black bags, your shopping bags, that all sits in there. Even the pallet wrap, which the local industry called chappies, 
is very popular for recycling. In KZN, they call them sticky. So you can just imagine the challenges that brings to a recycler. Our HD, which we already said is, is quite popular, um, no one picks up bottle closures, but if they arrive at the recycler in a bag, or on top of a bottle, obviously they're in the system. Polypropylene, we, in the last couple of years, we've really grown the flexible, um, even the metalized sweet wrappers. There's a couple of recyclers now that are doing that. Then obviously our PV, uh, PET, PVC and, and polystyrene. So where does it come from? And most of us driving around in South Africa have seen the waste picker. We think everything is coming from there, but the majority is actually harvested on landfill. So you've put it in your bin, it ends up with, in my case, in Johannesburg, with pick it up, they take it to landfill, and on landfill, these people going through that rubbish. Highly, highly ineffective. So this is an incoming stream from a recycler. Yeah, and you can't see the flies and you can't smell it because you're looking at a picture, but I can tell you it's not fun. So how does it get to the recycler? Typically via collectors. And the collectors will buy from the waste pickers and they will bail it and send it off to a recycler. This is obviously fantastic, it's sorted, it's already graded into certain materials. This is another one coming from um, the collectors via the, sorry, coming from the waste picket via the collector. And you can see the variety of materials in there, including shopping bags. This is more a bottle bale. You can see similar challenges. You don't smell the fruit milk. Um, when you're looking at a picture like that. A typical buyback center, so the waste pickers now harvesting from townships and from um, landfill, they will take it to buyback centers. And you can see this truck, the, the day I arrived there, the truck literally arrived a few minutes before me, and he opened the back flap, and you can just see it just spills out of that truck. Now it needs to be sorted into the various materials. So where does it end up? In South Africa, our recycler is predominantly ending in flexible packaging. You've heard the minister talking about the carrier bags with its 50% recycled content by law as of January this year, and it created an enormous pool for flexible films. In two years' time, 2025, it needs to be 75%. And then another two years' time, 100%. So you can imagine, currently we don't have enough for that. So you can imagine that additional demand that, that's feeding in there. Agricultural is another big, big market. Irrigation pipe, even a borehole liners, um, uprights for, for irrigation in your garden, that dark green pipe um, that's made from recycled. So if we just put it schematically and I combine the virgin market in South Africa and the recyclet from 2021, you can see there's certain markets where the material is just more popular because it, it can handle the, the less quality or the lower standards um, that's coming from the recyclet. So when we talk circular economy, we said we, we reuse, refill models, relatively little, and then we have a, a good recycling industry, not good enough, we definitely can't sit back and say, we've arrived. We'll hear this afternoon from two of our big recyclers, what they're telling you from success stories from their business. I always get tired when I look at this graph. But what you'll see often is circular, they say, you know, where does it come in and how does it go a, around? Now, that's what you're looking at here. And I don't, I'm not brave enough to try. Oh, here's my pointer. So if you look at incoming materials, currently the bulk of it is a byproduct from our fuel because we use a coal to, 
to petrol in South Africa. A byproduct, a waste product from that stream is the ethylene propylene. But we also have some coming from gas and then tiny, thin line coming from renewable products. We manufacture the raw materials, the ethylene, the propylene in South Africa, and then we polymerize it through companies like Safripol making polyethylene, polypropylene, and we end up making durable products and then our packaging and consumer good products. And you can see reuse, refill, those lines is miles too thick for what it's in the reality, because we, we're not there yet. Bulk of our waste ends up going to landfill, where some gets harvested, that's what the bottom arrows are showing, a little bit from curbside. We then sort it, sell it to the recyclers, and a little bit gets exported, this tiny bit of waste getting exported, and then it goes back into durable consumer products, and packaging. And that packaging, 125,000 tons, is predominantly flexible into carrier bags. Bottle to bottle in PET is, is big, and you'll, you'll hear XTP talk about that this afternoon. And we also have some other rigid packaging going back into packaging. So where do we want to be? Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't put them together on one slide. I'd, I'd uh, do that a bit later. We don't want to just throw away a durable product. We really need that reuse to be much bigger. The fixing, the repurposing. We need to, to grow that. We need to get into the habit of reusing and repairing and refilling. Um, if we just go back right to the beginning here, and I don't know where my pointer is, but you can see the green much thicker. We need to look at renewable resources as, as incoming materials. We need to have the recycling line much, much thicker. We also need to look at, and now we come to that energy and pyrolysis and other products, because currently we don't make, we have a tiny, tiny trial plant in South Africa that makes solvents and petroleums from recycled material, but we have opportunity to grow that. We have one plant that's doing uh, refuse-derived fuels. In other words, use it as energy source. We really need to look at that as well for, for materials that we cannot mechanically recycling cost-effective. If I press the right button, it might help. So where do we need to go? And some of you that was awake during the minister's call, which here, as you said, talk about the master plan. And the master plan is still with the um, Department of Trade and Industry for the minister's signature. But in essence, there we're saying these six pillars on which this thing is standing. And why do I only have five there? Because the, the environmental one, pillar number two, is what we're talking about today. But the other five pillars says, we, we're not going to grow the plastics consumption, but we really need to bring it local. Because all that stuff that we buy from made in China, do we know what's the ingredients? Do we know if it's a food approved additive in there? Do we know what printing inks they're using? Do we know what adhesives they're using? But if we bring that all back into South Africa and manufacture it here, it's a job that stays here, and it's a South African rand that stays here. So I hope you're starting to feel guilty about all that made in China stuff in your cupboard. And if I catch you parking at one of these China malls on Saturday, you're going to have a flat when you come out. <laughs> so what are we doing about collection? And I hear the waste pickers are here, and I'm glad they're part of the conversation. But this is a waste picker village not far from home, in actual fact about a kilometer. So they quickly on a Wednesday morning take the, the high value stuff from the bins, rush it off to their village, and then sort through it. And all the stuff that they think there's no value for, or that's heavy to carry, you can see ends up there. And 
every couple of now and then they put fire to it. That's not what we need. We can't encourage that behavior at all. When is the talk about the municipalities that have, doesn't have waste management in place, 62% of South Africans have a service. Okay, that sounds good. Turn it the other way around. More than 30% has no means to deal with their waste. They can't put it on the pavement and it, voila, it's gone by off this afternoon. Even if you live in Ikurulini and they don't come that week, at least you know they're going to come maybe week two, three, four, five. <laughs> but what about the 30% of people that don't have a bin? Do me a favor and ask your domestic worker and ask your gardener what do they do with their waste? And maybe you should start telling them to bring it to you so you can put it in your bin so it doesn't end up in the Yekskai River or on the Apis River. Because what else is there to do? So what's currently happening is schematically, I put it in my bin, pick it up, collects it. The waste picker either gets it from the landfill or from my bin. He sells it to a bucky brigade that takes it to a waste management company and they bale it and it ends up with a recycler. Miles too long. So we have lots of initiatives in place. One of them saying we need to design for recycling. We need to design for circularity and that will grow recycling. Yeah, maybe. We need to look at alternatives. One of our retailers says I'd rather tick off that as no longer in plastic and put it for you in paper. But strangely enough, that specific paper product isn't recycled in South Africa either. So what did we achieve? Or we can say, let's incorporate the waste pickers. Pay them more. Make it easier for them. Will it help? For some products to some degree. Do we need to use bigger markets? Yeah, maybe 100% content in recycling, a recycled content in a carrier bag will grow the tonnage. But none of these things is going to work if it doesn't get collected. So someone needs to bend down, pick it up, and take it somewhere else. And that's not the ideal. So what are we saying? We need to shorten that value chain. We need to move from picking to sorting. So this is quite a busy slide, and I'm sure Safri Paul will distribute it as well. But it's all based on two bins, wet stuff and the others. Now people ask me, where do I put the nappies? At this stage, please, with the wet stuff, because we don't have a solution for that. Dry stuff then goes as is to a beneficiation center. And this is this middle portion here where the EPR money can come in and saying, waste pickers, come here. You don't have to walk for eight hours to get to all the bins. Just come to this spot and sort. The first guy will still pick aluminum cans and the second one K4 cartons and milk bottles and pet bottles. But by three o'clock, someone is going to pick up the bottle caps and the drinking straws because they're all in one place sell them for their own pockets, and maybe even start adding value at that site by the, the waste pickers themselves. So if we put it in, in a, a flow diagram, everything in the box can happen at that beneficiation center. So if we can start having waste pickers investing in balers, in granulators, and maybe we can even put the additional stuff like making something with the residual, which could be warm up the water in the showers with some energy that we can generate. Or maybe just make some pavers, which we know can be done. So what are the other things we can do, which we're already doing in South Africa? There's some difficult to recycle material going into building blocks, into roads, into bricks, into pavers. There's some, I mentioned to you, the trial plant that's putting it into solvents or shoe polish. And then there's the guys making these press stuff, either a thing that looks like plastic timber or sheeting. There's one company in Boxburg making toilets for the rural areas that kids can't scribble their names on the walls because the plastic 
prevents that. Beautiful buildings. So yeah, where are we now? This is that busy picture. And if we need to grow to where we want to be, we really, each of us need to start thinking, where's my product? What is my behavior? And how can I solve the litter problem? And maybe start with your domestic worker and your gardener and the cleaner at work, and you say, where do you live? Do you have a bin? Where do you put your rubbish in? Do you have a facility? So my topic was, where's the South Africa plastics industry and its transition to the circular, low-carbon economy? Shucks, Avashni, and I sometimes wonder if we both agreed on that, and I know I did. But where are we? We've made good progress, but we haven't arrived. And none of us can sit back and say, we, we're doing right. We really need to focus on every product that's leave, leaving our factories and say, where is it going? We know plastic is the material of choice. There's enough evidence. We've read, read, read enough life cycle assessments. We look at greenhouse gas emissions. Plastics is really fantastic. We have recyclers. We have more than 300 active plastics recyclers in South Africa. But our collection and our waste management is a challenge. I'm currently visiting recyclers. Each and every one said to me, load shedding is a problem, but I can't get enough material. I wish I can get more material. Do you know where I can buy more material? And we need to get a handle on our waste. Don't think it's someone else's problem. Don't think that I make a long life water reticulation pipe. That pipe in 50 years time is not my problem. Sorry, surprise for you. We need to start thinking, where is my product going into? What is going to happen when that product eventually comes back? And that's me. Thank you so much.